next uh, speaker, I got a, first heard about when I got a call um, a few years ago saying that there was someone in London bringing together all of the, um, the key people for a new IPCC climate change issue, a uh, report that was coming out to try and look at the media communication. And uh, there was a, a phrase in the email that said that he, had, he was an undergraduate at Plymouth University and would really like someone from Plymouth University to be there at that gathering. And I went through intrigued as to who this person was. And um, Anthony Hobley did a chemistry with physics degree at Plymouth Poly. He then went on to a research uh, at, at Cambridge and he then left there to do a law degree, an environmental law degree in, uh, in Leicester. And then proceeded to go into uh, the legal profession as a solicitor specialising really in sustainability, environmental and climate change. And a few years ago left that um, to start or to be CEO of Carbon Tracker. Carbon Tracker is a company that kind of goes and use, goes into the financial institutions and companies at a really high level to talk about fossil fuels and the real cost of fossil fuels. In other words, it's a very different kind of environment, but, but as I say, another of the real world. So I'm delighted to invite up Anthony Hobby. Ian, thank you. It was wonderful to be back here. I had three amazing years. As I got off at the station earlier on and walked up the hill, as you know, from the train station, I reflected actually on one very drunken night where it could have all ended quite abruptly. For some reason, at three o'clock in the morning after a night out in the Barbican and Union Street, I decided it would be a really good idea to ride that hill in an old shopping trolley. I think it was a Sainsbury's trolley from memory. Um, battered, bruised, uh, bleeding a little bit, I survived and, and staggered home. Um, and the rest is history. Um, so, yeah, I, I've had a very interesting career. As I said, science to the law, spent many years as a corporate lawyer, working on corporate legal transactions and all of the environmental issues um, around that. Spent an interesting time in Australia, got very involved in the advocacy around a carbon price and Australian politics um, around climate change, which is a whole another presentation in its own, um, own right. But what has been incredibly exciting, as Ian said, when I got back from Australia, I got, I got very interested in how you communicate this issue. And I remember as part of that initiative, I hosted a dinner one night um, at my then law firm, um, in one of the very plush, you know, client dining rooms, with a, a whole group of, of people who sort of worked in the legal and financial profession. And I sat next to Peter Clark, who's the environment correspondent for the Financial Times. And you know, I, I've known Peter for a long time, we're quite good friends. And I said, Peter, you know, and this was, I think, four years ago, four and a half years ago, you know, it's great, Peter, that you write about this and your environment colleagues at the other major newspapers and media outlets. But, you know, why don't the business correspondents, why don't, you know, economic commentators like Martin Wolf at the FT, why, why don't the energy correspondents, you know, why don't the markets and commodities correspondents write about climate and sustainability? And I think it became obvious to me and others because it was, the story was not being told. And I think this is, fact, this, you know, this is a good follow-up to the previous amazing presentation. How you tell the story is, is important in every aspect of this. It, it's critical. You've got to have the right narrative. And I, I believe that for many years, and I consider myself an environmentalist, 20 years in this space, um, I think many of us, and I've been guilty of this, um, you know, we, we try and speak at our audience in our own language, um, you know, using our own terminology, and we don't spend the time to empathise, to step into their shoes and understand what's important to them. How do they think? How do you reframe this message in a way that resonates with your audience? Now, at Carbon Tracker, we live and we exist within the financial markets. You know, our world is investment bankers, corporate lawyers, accountants, actuaries, asset managers, people who manage your pension funds. And whatever they do in their spare time, in their work lives, that they're not very sort of fluffy and cuddly people. It's all about the bottom line and the financial return. And quite frankly, more often than not, meeting their targets and getting their bonus in the next 12 months. How do you get these people to care 
And they're really, this is a really important constituency because if we're going to make the transition we need to make to, for a more sustainable society, a more sustainable planet, if we're going to actually stabilise our climate, these are the people who are going to have to make some important decisions and finance that transition. They're critical. How do you get them to care about this? Well, you have to get them to understand that this is not just a moral and ethical issue. I mean, that's a given. This is a financial issue. It's a financial risk issue. It's a financial liability issue. It's also a major financial opportunity. So Carbon Tracker, we like to think of ourselves as, I guess, climate activists in pinstripe suits. What's interesting about Carbon Tracker, all of us are refugees, if you like, from financial market careers. I was a corporate lawyer until two and a half years ago. Our founder built some of the biggest you know, funds at places like Henderson's and Jupiter in the city of London. The biggest team within Carbon Tracker is seven former investment bank analysts. So if you like, you know, we use investment grade financial analysis. We fight fire with fire. So a little bit of background and what we're most famous for is creating this idea of a carbon bubble. Well, what is that? I'm sure actually I'm teaching my grandmother to suck eggs here when we talk about the carbon budget, but bear with me. It's a very simple concept. If you take the IPCC report, um, what the climate scientists have done is they've worked out we have a carbon budget. If, you know, if we want a reasonable probability of staying out or below two degrees. So the carbon budget effectively is around 2,000 gigatons of carbon against pre-industrial levels. So that's the amount the atmosphere can absorb and give us an 80% probability of staying below, at or below two degrees. I often wonder if you said to most people, well, you know what, great news, that jet plane you're about to get onto New York is an 80% probability you're going to land safely in New York. You'd actually get on that plane, but there you go, that, those are the odds we're playing with. Now the bad news, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, We've used well over 1,000 gigatons. We have 900, probably less now, 900 gigatons left to put into the atmosphere. But again, if I went and talked to your average asset manager or investment banker, and I talked about a carbon budget, 2,000 gigatons, 900 gigatons, you know, that would mean nothing to them in their day-to-day -day job, in their day-to-day -day decisions. How do you translate that into something that actually makes sense to those guys in their world, in their day-to-day -day jobs? Well. What we did is we said, okay, well, you know, what are these people, what do they care about? Well, they care about things that have value, assets, and how those assets relate to the value of companies and shares and equities and investment decisions. So what's a, what are real life assets that are really relevant to this? Well, all the oil, coal, and gas in the ground, you know, the, the, the fossil fuel reserves and resources upon which all of the major energy companies in the world are valued. So how do the two relate? Well, we, we know we've got a budget of 900 gigatons left. How much carbon is locked up in all of that oil, gas, and coal that the future of Exxon or Chevron or Peabody Coal depends on? And when you compare the two, you see there's a massive, massive difference. 900 gigatons versus over t nearly 3,000 gigatons of carbon locked up in all of that oil, gas, and coal that those companies want to dig out of the ground and burn. So that ain't taken us to two degrees, that's taken us to six degrees several times over. I think that the analogy is back in the 70s when, interestingly again, philanthropically funded NGOs for the first time counted, and, and many people at great risk to their personal liberty and even you know, physical well-being, went out into places like Russia and the United States and counted up all of the nuclear warheads and realised there was enough gigatons of nuclear warheads out there um, to basically fry the planet five or six times over. Well, there's enough carbon locked up in oil, gas and coal those companies want to dig out of the ground and burn to take us to six degrees several times over. Forget about two degrees. So, you know, it, it is uh, an existential issue we're dealing with. But they believe they can make a lot, a lot of money out of doing that and that's how the world functions. How do you change their view, their perception of that? Well, you have to get them to understand that increasingly pouring money into developing that oil, gas and coal is risky. The world is changing. They're actually more likely to lose their money by doing that than make money. Um, effectively, you know, we term the you know, we use this term stranded assets. And what we mean by that is effectively they will not achieve the economic return that these guys, when they put their money into them, are banking on. The economic return they could have probably felt quite comfortable about 
10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but actually, no, sorry, the world is changing. Wake up and understand that fact. Now, what's interesting is in business history, this happens again and again and again. In major incumbent businesses, eight times out of 10, rarely survive these transitions. You know, there's a Kodak, Blockbuster, Olivetti typewriters, um, the American Steam Locomotive Company. Because if they did, the cars you drive would be manufactured by the companies that used to manufacture steam locomotives. The you know, cameras in our smartphones would be manufactured by Kodak. Our laptops wouldn't be manufactured by Apple, they'd be manufactured by Olivetti. Um, group think sets in in these companies and they struggle. They, you know, they know how to do, you know, the world stays the same for a number of decades. They know how to work in that world. But what they don't know how to do is react and deal with the world when it reaches these points of change, these tipping points. And that's where we are now with the energy system and, and with sustainability. So the big question is history repeating itself for the likes of Chevron, BP, etc. At the moment, those companies, certainly one of those companies, and that's probably the same for all of them, is borrowing over a billion dollars a month to continue to pay the dividend the pension funds expect because they also want to continue to pour trillions into these projects that make neither climate nor financial sense. One of my favorite quotes is the American Steam Locomotive Company, the chairman in 1980, sorry, 1930, made a speech on Wall Street. He was defending the massive investment they just made in the next generation of steam locomotives. And in the face of these two technological upstarts that had just entered the Dow Jones, I think called General Motors and Ford, and he said, mark my words, steam locomotion will be the dominant form of transport until well into the 1980s and beyond. The American Steam Locomotive Company, which was, you know, in its day as big as Chevron or Exxon on the, on the equity markets, was gone within 16 years of him making that speech, completely and utterly bankrupt and uh, wound up. And we see this again and again. So this is one of my favorite sort of, uh, you know, quiz, quizzes, if you like, or... Uh, Challenges. 1900, the Easter Parade on Fifth Avenue. Can you spot the motor car? There is one in there. One. Amongst all the horses and carriages. A mere 13 years later, can you spot the horse, of carriage, the horse and carriage, the same Easter Day Parade on Fifth Avenue? In 13 years, that massive technological transformation happened from horse-drawn carriages to the motor car. And I believe we are now seeing, we're now in the same transition around energy and energy supply. But if you'd asked anyone in 1900, 8 out of 10, probably 9 out of 10 people would not have been able to predict or would have thought you were mad if you told them in 13 years this whole street will be full of motor cars and there will only be one horse and carriage. The fossil fuel industry is no different. The, the graph here shows all of the projections going back for the last, back to sort of 2000 from the IEA, but similar projections from, from all of the demand, energy demand scenarios from Exxon, Shell, Chevron, etc., of how they thought solar was going to pan out. And obviously the, the line at the top is what solar is actually doing in terms of growth and um, in, you know, rollout and the, the sort of reduction in price. We're also seeing the same with storage. And every expert in this space predicts that you know, once we get that breakthrough with storage, I mean, it is a whole new game. And at the moment, you know, the, the Tesla's Powerwall is seven years ahead of the industry average forecasts, 25 years ahead of the US EIA's forecast in terms of its development. So this is really beginning to take off. If we go to all of the energy demand scenarios, you know, and we've produced a report called Lost in Transition where we've unpicked these, and we, and we really believe there, there is massive group think going on. The assumptions that underpin these models, basically the assumptions you would pick if you want to justify your business model, not necessarily what's going to ha actually happen. So the highest, they take the highest assumptions for GDP growth, forgetting what, the, you know, what kind of disruption climate, you know, unabated climate change would do to GDP growth, the highest projections for population growth, but on the other hand, they take the lowest projections for things like energy efficiency, solar, renewable energy, um, and so forth. And lo and behold, they get, you know, they get what comes out of all of these demand models is massive growth for demand in oil, gas, and coal. 
Paris. What does that mean? We've got this massive new climate treaty. Um, what does that mean in practice? My own view on this is it's no longer a top-down situation. The reason we got a Paris Agreement is because between 2009, when we failed to achieve a global agreement in Copenhagen, and 2015, the technology had matured to such a degree and the costs had dropped so dramatically in that period that world leaders could see how they could deliver a climate agreement. It's the technological transition that is now in the driving seat. The policy, things like Paris, are about a market signal and are about how quickly that technological transition happens, about speeding it up, oiling the wheels, if you like. But it's now the technological transition that is well and truly in the drive. We are in the midst of a low carbon energy transition. The reductions in emissions, but again, the, the energy companies are not on the same page. If we achieve even the modest commitments in Paris and the INDCs, we would see about a 20% reduction by 2030 in demand for oil, gas and coal. Yet, these are the projections still coming out of the industry. BP is projecting a 24% increase in fossil fuel use by 2035, Exxon 27, Shell 37% by 2040, and OPEX clinging to a, a growth of 54%. Well, the climate is toast if that happens. Um, let alone what's actually happening, as I say, in terms of technology and what we, t we call demand destruction. There is real demand destruction going on because of the clean technologies, because of efficiency, um, because of the internet of things, um, and last but not least, because of climate policy um, and regulation. And money is pouring into projects, really high cost projects that make neither climate nor financial sense. Kashagon is one of Shell's biggest projects with a number of other oil and, oil and gas companies. I am told Shell insiders jokingly refer to this as cash all gone. <laughs> so far eaten up $50 billion with very few barrels of oil actually having been produced um, as a result. Shell spent $2.5 billion on one exploratory well in the Arctic and obviously also massive, massive damage to their brand. Um, Similar stories uh, for many other projects. Projects that will only ever make money if we return to a high oil price environment. And many experts do not believe that is going to happen anytime soon. A massive, and the continue to pour money into these projects and borrow massively to pay the dividend is a massive gamble by these companies on a future high oil price. We carried out a piece of analysis called the Danger Zone Report, where we actually looked at what we thought, you know, projects that we're going to lose money in effect, for want of a better description. High cost, high carbon projects, you know, which are likely to destroy value. Some 1.4 trillion in the oil sector, 220 billion in the coal sector, and 520 billion um, worth of projects in the gas sector. But yet, many of the shareholders and investors in the financial markets are allowing these companies to get away with this potentially putting the future of those companies at risk, um, potentially destroying trillions in value. And that matters to all of us because actually all of us who pay into pensions or investments, a large amount of those pensions is tied up in these companies. And it, as I said, it's not just about Paris. It's about the huge investment and focus on technology. The world's two biggest economies now are completely focused on this technological um, innovation. And just to give you some statistics on this to demonstrate the direction we're going in, the cost of onshore wind has fallen 29% since 2008. That's impressive, but not as impressive as uh, photovoltaic sales have fallen 99.1% between 1977 and 2013. Um, the price of electricity generated by solar PV has fallen from $76 a watt in 77 to 0.74 of a watt in 13, and we're still seeing these prices drop, the costs of this drop. Um, still way behind, but we've now got a million electric vehicles on the road. We're getting close to critical mass, again, where you could you can begin to see where we may see an exponential takeoff um, in this transition. Even the old lady on Needle Street, Bank of England, is now interested in this. 
governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, sitting next to Michael Bloomberg. And what was interesting about Paris, I've been to a lot of these international climate negotiations. I have never seen at any of these until Paris the governor of one of the world's major central banks bother to turn up. Not only to turn up, make a major speech and a major announcement, sitting next to you know, one of the world's most successful billionaires, who again, whose business is financial information, Michael uh, Bloomberg. And they announced the creation of a financial stability board climate risk task force. We're now working with very closely to look at what do the financial markets need, what disclosures do the financial markets need to have to ensure that they understand this transition risk, this climate risk that's, that's now um, making itself you know, felt in the markets. And the biggest risk is, again, is we ignore this, we ignore this and we have an abrupt transition and that's what we want to avoid. The lawyers are getting more interested. I mean, I'm sure many of you have read, there are now 17 um, US attorneys generals investigating Exxon and what Exxon really knew about climate change and whether they deliberately set out to mislead governments and the public on the extent of this problem for their own commercial benefit. And more importantly, many of those attorney generals are also looking at the extent to which these companies have mis been misleading their shareholders, which potentially is much more likely to be successful um, in any legal action. And investors. Um, a recent EY survey found that two-thirds of investors are concerned about the stranded asset risk in the market as a result of climate risk and the energy transition. 30, recent, a couple of weeks ago, 38% of Exxon shareholders and 41% of Chevron shareholders voted on resolutions to require those companies to carry out two-degree stress tests on their business models. Last year, two climate resolutions were passed unanimously um, at Shell and BP's AGMs. Now, counterintuitively, we, but we all suspected because of all of this, because of the transition, because of demand destruction, because of the money being poured into these incredibly expensive projects, that actually these companies may be in a stronger financial position, better share price, and ability to continue to pay those dividends upon which many of our pension funds are hooked, if they go into an ex-growth phase. By continuing to, you know, doggedly stick to a growth model, which was fine for 60 years, but which is no longer relevant, they are potentially destroying value and potentially putting their businesses at risk. But if they move into an ex-growth phase, where they, can, they continue to supply the, you know, the oil, gas and coal we need for the next 30 years as part of the transition, but less and less every year, um, this may be better for their share price and their dividend. And we carried out a piece of sensitivity financial analysis and we found, you know, we made a strong case for why that is likely to be the case. Put them, into a, put them onto a two degree pathway and they may actually be worth more, which is counterintuitive, but you know, it's an important message to get across. And finally, I mean, the FT have picked up on this, um, and I'll finish with this quote. You know, we, may begin, we may be at the beginning of a long twilight for these companies. No, we're not going to see the end of fossil fuels overnight, but we are going to see you know, probably a two to three decade runoff of this industry if we're going to stabilize the climate. And as the FT said, Rather than investing in potentially stranded oil and gas projects or gambling on new technologies that they do not fully understand, the oil companies would do better to continue returning money to shareholders through dividends and share buybacks. Now, just to conclude, I think we've had great success with reframing the message, understanding, because we're financial market professionals, the language of our audience, the financial markets, um, and using investment grade financial analysis to do that. But what's critical, and I'll finish with a, an anecdote, uh, a little story. When we launched our coal report back in 2014, the Minerals Council of Australia managed to, for a journalist, get a copy of the report, and they sent it to their mate at the Australian newspaper. If anyth anyone knows anything about the Australian media, it's a very climate skeptic uh, publication, putting it mildly. They ran a whole article on us and the coal report and I can summarise it, basically climate activists pretending to be financial analysts. So you thought that would be quite damaging. The editor of FT Lex, now the FT Lex is a column that comes out in the Financial Times once a week, and if you're a financial analyst, I, I don't know this, but I was told this by my financial analyst colleagues, you know, you live to get your 
research written up in two places, the FT Lex column or The Economist. Um, so the editor saw this article, thought, why, why is the Minerals Council of Australia trying so hard to rubbish this report? Got his team to read it, and we got the entire FT Lex column that week, which then meant we got coverage right across the financial press, mainstream press, um, even The Economist, um, as a result of that. So thank you very much to the Minerals Council of Australia for doing our PR. But the moral of that story is, you know, if our financial analysis had not stood up to scrutiny, if it was not investment grade, good quality, you know, and made sense, we would have been uncloaked as climate activists pretending to be financial analysts. We're actually financial analysts who also happen to be climate activists. Thank you. <laughs>